Reverend Boswell, thank you for the invitation to be among the saints of Myers Park Baptist today. And I bring you greetings from your friends that gather at Sardis Baptist Meeting House. May we pray together. O oh God of love, may your spirit move within words spoken and thoughts conceived in minds and daydreams that dance with wonder. Amen. When Martin Luther pounded nails into the Wittenberg church doors, hanging his 95 statements for all to see on All Hallows' Eve 502 years ago, it would have been inconceivable for any priest or beggar, carpenter or monk, peasant or blacksmith, child or grandparents, to not believe in God. Luther and everyone around him lived in an enchanted world, just beyond the veil of what you could see and feel lay a whole nother existence of spirits and angels, demons and fairies, which were in a cosmic battle that spilled over into the material world. The spirits were ever present in every sickness and every recovery, with every crop and every harvest. How could you not believe in God? How different is our world in the 21st century? We live in a disenchanted world. There are no monsters in the dark, no fairies with lucky charms. Every sickness has a biological reason and every recovery a medical explanation. The stars have not been fixed in the sky immovable, but are expanding at near light speed in a universe that is 13 billion years old. And our Earth is not the center of the universe, but simply a small sphere that can't be seen by 99% of the universe. In such a world, beliefs beyond what can be seen and touched and tested face rigorous debate. Harvey Cox wrote in The Future of Faith that the spread of the scientific method, which requires publicly verifiable evidence has challenged the credibility of propositions that were based on authority. A religion based on mandatory beliefs is no longer viable. Echoing Cox words are those of John Shelby Spong from his most recent book, Unbelievable. The explosion of knowledge over the last 500 years in the West has rendered most biblical and creedal presuppositions unbelievable. They rise up from a world that no longer exists. The result is that Christianity seems less and less believable to more and more people. A common way of reading the Gospels is to merge their messages, to kind of create one composite Jesus, like a puzzle that's been put together maybe at the lake or the beach sometime this summer. This is understandable. It's how biographers research their subjects using multiple interviews to construct a summary story. And I must admit, that is one valid way to read the Gospels. 
But I think that we lose much with Jesus when we merge all these stories together. In practicing Midrash, I talk about the wisdom of allowing contradictory passages in the Bible to remain in tension. To, if you will, allow them to keep arguing with each other throughout the generations. I think we are better served with a split screen Jesus. A Matthean Jesus, a Luke, a Mark and Jesus, a Luke and Jesus, a Johann and Jesus, where we can see them argue with each other. Our gospel readings today from Matthew, Mark, and John provide three different portraits of Jesus. The passage from John spells out the author's purpose and theology. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not in this book. But these are written. In other words, I, John, picked these stories so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have eternal life in his name. Believing in Jesus is all over John's gospel. 20 times he uses that phrase. Over 90 times he uses the word believe in his gospel. But when John says that you must believe, he's not talking about faith. He actually never uses the word faith in his whole gospel. He means that to be a Christian, a person has to believe certain things about Jesus. That he is the Son of God, the Messiah, fully human, fully divine, and one with God. John's gospel is the beginning of Christian orthodoxy. Did you know that there is only one commandment in the whole Gospel of John. Just one commandment. To love one another. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that extremely odd. I mean, in Matthew's Gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, which is just three chapters in Matthew's Gospel, there are over some two dozen commandments. How is it that John only has one commandment? Well, John doesn't think that doing things has anything to do with Christianity. It's all about believing certain things about Jesus. So, so Jesus teaches throughout John's gospel, but he's always talking about himself. He is the word made flesh, the living water, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the resurrection. And John uses all these narratives to tell you and me more about Jesus so that we might believe in him and have eternal life. So what do we do with John's Jesus in a disenchanted world where beliefs are unbelievable? Maybe we should listen to Matthew's Jesus argue with John's Jesus. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew's Jesus says in the passage we read earlier. And although written before John's gospel, Matthew is very clear that he doesn't think believing will cut it. Only those who do the will of God will enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew's Jesus says. And then he concludes with that parable of the builders, which affirms those who believe in Jesus' teachings and do them while condemning those who believe in Jesus' teachings but don't do them. For Matthew, doing God's will is the essential work of disciples. 
So the Sermon on the Mount, as I said, has over two dozen commandments for disciples to follow, such as love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, turn the other cheek, walk the second mile, practice your piety in private, forgive completely. Do not judge others, but in fact treat others as you would like to be treated, the golden rule. Matthew's Jesus doesn't seem to care what you believe. What matters is what you do. In the passage we read from Mark's gospel, a scribe asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Go back and read it. The word belief is nowhere in Jesus' answer. He combines two, two commandments from his own faith tradition. The Shema from Deuteronomy 6, to love God with your whole being, with everything about you, your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the call from Leviticus to love your neighbor as yourself. That Mark's Jesus should call this the greatest commandment is not surprising. The Mark in Jesus imparts few specific ethical standards for his disciples to keep. Yet, discipleship in Mark means to devote, to commit your whole life to following Jesus. So this greatest commandment is overarching with very few specifics, but it calls us to love God with all that we are. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will save it. Mark chapter 8. Anyone who wants to be first, to be number one, must be the servant of all, must be last of all. Chapter 9. When a rich man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him to sell everything his, uh, he owns, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Chapter 10. And then later, when his disciples see the wealthy give large sums of money in the temple with lots of fanfare, Jesus points out a poor widow and tells his disciples to watch her put in her last two coins into the offering plate. Two is the key detail. By having two, she could have kept one, poor as she was. But she gives both. She gives all. Chapter 12. Mark's Jesus heals the sick, offers hope to the downtrodden, forgives sin, welcomes all, and then calls all he welcomes to devote themselves completely in following him. But he doesn't seem to care what they believe about him. In fact, the so-called messianic secret in Mark which is a scholarly examination about Jesus' refusal to allow the demons to identify him over and over in Mark's gospel. This so-called messianic secret may be nothing more than Mark's Jesus having no desire to facilitate debates about what people believe about him. How refreshing. We are, now, we are now seeing how debates about identifying beliefs have polarized our national politics. The president is more interested in branding his opponents with disparaging names, Pocahontas, Sleepy Joe, Crazy Nancy, and of course, Crooked Hillary, rather than talking about national policies and having debates about how to solve the problems in our nation. And likewise, many of his critics simply disparage him 
with ap ap apocalyptic descriptions instead of focusing on policies and having conversations about how we might turn this nation around and reconcile us as one. And we can see how this has turned off so many people, particularly young people, to politics. Is it any wonder that Mark's Jesus avoids such debates? Mark is about faith, not beliefs, and certainly not debates about beliefs. A few weeks ago, MacMen, Charlotte's Interfaith Network, asked me to speak on my book during their monthly Food for Thought luncheon. And during the Q&A time, a participant asked if I believed that Jesus is the only way, truth, and life, as it says in John's Gospel. I first thought, really? You're going to ask me that question in an interfaith gathering, <laughs> right? I mean, just throw me under the bus right there. I was glad that I didn't have to double down on Jesus and then offend Jews and Muslims, Baha'is and Buddhists who were at the luncheon. His question, though, gave me the opportunity to say that this is exactly, exactly the reason Christians should borrow from the ancient Jewish practice of Midrash when reading scripture. John's gospel certainly believed that Jesus was the only way to worship God. And a lot of Christians, because of John, feel the same way. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke repudiate this exclusive way to worship God. Matthew's Jesus told the parable of the sheep and the goats, in which those who minister to the hungry and the immigrant, the sick and the imprisoned, inherit the kingdom of God, while those who do not serve the least of these are condemned, indicating that the way to God is as broad as a person's compassion. So many Christians, maybe many in this sanctuary, can say, no, I don't think Jesus is the only way. And if you're one of those, the nice thing is that you can also say, but don't take my word for it. Matthew's Jesus doesn't believe that either. See, the Bible is this living word because it contains contrasting multiple theologies about God, which have been arguing with each other for at least 2,500, if not 3,000 years, and which invite us into the conversation to join the debates and work to figure out what makes sense for the living of these days. And the Gospels are just one example of the Bible's contrasting texts. We have this morning quickly looked at three of these Gospels. John, which focuses on beliefs or orthodoxy. Matthew, which was much more interested in orthopraxy or right practice. And Mark's Gospel who focuses purely on faith instead of belief at all, or any commandments. And these differences are not just semantic. The difference between faith and belief is real. Years ago, when I was a teenager, I, I heard Tony Campolo, the American Baptist evangelist, illustrate this difference between belief and faith. He told the story of Charles Blondin, who became famous in the 19th century for walking on a tightrope over Niagara Falls Gorge. He did this so many times to crowds that became bigger and bigger that he became a national sensation. Harper's Weekly, in fact, drew a cartoon in which Lincoln is drawn as Blondin 
pushing a wheelbarrow across the tightrope. And Lincoln himself, during the Civil War, said he felt like Blondin trying to walk this tightrope back across Niagara Falls. One time, according to Campolo, Blondin crosses over the Niagara Falls Gorge from the American to the Canadian side to great cheers from the crowd, always working to add another layer of suspense to his act. He asked the crowd, do you believe that I can carry a person back across the tightrope? We believe, the crowd roared. We believe, we believe. And then when the cheering subsided slightly, he yelled, and who will volunteer? <laughs> and a hush settled upon the crowd. I never forget Campolo saying, belief is simply an affirmation of your thoughts in your mind. Faith is about risking and trusting your life. By the way, with no volunteers, Blondin carried his manager, piggyback, back across the tight ropes. And once he got there safely, the, the crowd cheered again, having their beliefs safely confirmed. <laughs> Our disenchanted, scientific, multicultural world has upended religious beliefs and called into question long-held doctrines. Harvey Cox, however, says this is not a threat to the Christian faith. Rather, we should receive this as good news. I have shown how Christianity, he writes, which began as a movement of the Spirit through faith, guided by faith, soon clotted into a catalog of beliefs administered by a clerical class. But now, the process is reversing faith is resurgent, he says, while dogma is dying. Faith, the passionate trust of living your life for a higher purpose still offers much to this disenchanted world. To love God with your whole being and your neighbor as much as yourself may have absolutely nothing to do with what you believe about God, but everything to do with how you want to live your life into God's peace and justice for this broken world. Our disenchanted society is still open to a faith that's worth living for, a faith that's dedicated to transformation a faith that's an authentic human exploration 